Hello everybody, and welcome back once again to yet another addition to my One Piece journey. After the momentous, magnificent, epic Marineford arc, uh, I don't think there will ever be an arc like that in One Piece again, in media again. I don't think I'll ever experience anything like that again. Um, but we move on, and we move on to amazing things again as we get into the post-war arc this week. I also think I'll talk about the Return to Sabaudi mini-arc sort of thing, the post-time skip uh, congregation of all the Straw Hats, because I think it feeds in pretty directly with the storytelling uh, and the themes, and it works as an answer to the post-war arc in a really good way that kind of puts a nice cap on this part of the story. So today we're going to be talking about post-war, as well as, yeah, Return to Sabaudi. My recording schedule for this is a bit fragmented once again, so I don't know... I might have to put in the AJP's comments at the end of this video again. I'll see how you guys respond to how you guys liked it in the Marine Ford video before deciding what to do with it. Uh, if not, I'll probably just splice it in here, but otherwise, uh, because I have not actually uploaded the Marine Ford video just yet, so I can't record AJP's comments. So those will come in at a different uh, recording, and the location will be either here or at the end. If it's here, I'll splice it in right now. If it's not here, that was just a really awkward silence, and it'll be at the end of the video. Hello? I lied. I am not splicing in AJP's comments at the end of the video. I am putting them right here, but I just like past AJ looking like a fool. Though, it seems I don't need much help with that sometimes. These will be the AJP's comments for the Impel Down video. Now, there is one thing I want to address, um, and that is the way I worded some of my points about Hanya Ball's outburst during Impel Down. Now, there were a few people, like three or four, someone like that, who took exception to the way in which I phrased my ideas on Hanya Ball's speech. Now, there were a few misconceptions there. A lot of people assumed that I was assuming that, or that I, that I didn't know that a lot of the pirates in prison in Impel Down deserved to be there. Uh, of course they do. Definitely. I just didn't think that was worth pointing out because it seemed to me like assumed knowledge. So when I said that Hanyabal doesn't have much of a leg to stand on, people took exception or offense or whatever to that, don't want to speak for anyone else, but there was pushback because of the idea that the world government as an entity needs to exist for the order of keeping bad pirates in line. There were a few people saying, you know, bad people are in prison here, the majority are bad people. I know. Um, and then there were a lot of people saying that, you know, Luffy has done bad by setting out these monsters as well on his way to trying to rescue Ace. I know, absolutely. These to me all seem like, I don't know, I, I thought it would just be assumed. But it's on me, my mistake, because I do realize with topics as sensitive as, as these, assuming that other people will know what you mean, even if you're confident in that, is not a given at all and you should be as clear as possible. So to be clear, I am absolutely aware that... Impel Down is necessary, that the world government are necessary for order, for keeping a lot of horrible pirates in, in tow, in check, for keeping them imprisoned. I'm absolutely aware that Luffy is did a quite a few bad things. Um, the bad overpowered the good in Impel Down. Um, well aware of that. And my point here was not that Hanyabal doesn't have a point. What do you expect? is more or less what I was trying to say. Because the world government are absolutely necessary to keep the world in check, to keep all these horrible pirates, these horrible people, uh, from turning civilization, the world, into an absolute catastrophe. Uh, a lot of the reason that there are safe islands out there are because the world government keep pirates in line. Now, a lot of the pain out there is also because of the world government, but because of that first point, they're necessary for order. Absolutely. That's why this is a sort of grey topic, and that's why I talked about GARP in the way I did in my last Marine Ford video. However, they have founded their justice and order through horrible means. Immoral means, uh, cruelty, uh, widespread devastation and pain. And my point is that, sure, the world government are necessary. However, their execution leaves a lot to be desired, to say the least. And they have no right to be outraged that people try to stop them when the reason people try to stop them is because they are cruel and corrupt as hell. You blow up Ohara, you pursue literal children because of their knowledge, uh, you kill people because of their bloodline. What do you expect when people fight back against that? So I understand the purpose of the world government and Impel Down and all of that. 
I get it, it's very necessary for the world. They do lots of good, but they also do lots of bad. And so when people try to rise up to counteract that bad because they've been personally hurt, you cannot act morally outraged at that. That is, to me, that is just blind indoctrination or bias or stupidity or lack of foresight and lack of perspective and all of that sort of thing. That's my point, more or less. The world government is absolutely necessary for order. They are not evil in totality. Not everything they do is evil. But if they don't want people to rise up against them, then they shouldn't blow up islands. And one more thing is that um, I used the word unlawful in the Impel Down video. That was the wrong word to use um, because it was technically within the bounds of the law. But to me, I mean, the, the, point, the point is clear because they set the law. They set it themselves. Uh, it is within their bounds of the law, but it is still corrupt and evil as all hell. Some of the things they do. So hopefully that clears some things up. Uh, as always, like I say all the time, uh, because of the unscripted nature of these videos, some of the points I make, especially on nuanced topics, will not have the best wording that I would do if I were scripting out a video. So just keep that in mind, and I will continue to correct myself along the way, if necessary. And while I was criticizing Hannibal for his speech there, uh, for his lack of uh, perspective, like I kind of indicated, it's very likely that he had no idea of the... Uh, the cruelty of the world government and the sort of things they've done to, like, Tom or Robin or whatever. So if he is oblivious to all that, I'm not criticizing him. The grander point is aimed at the world government. Now onto the actual comments. Um, Sarah Brewer says, One thing that I love about Oda's writing is that he understands his character so well that a simple meaning can be used to introduce such an important villain like Blackbeard. His introduction in Skypiea is so impactful and only gains weight as the series continues. And yet that simple introduction established the core of who Blackbeard is and his eventual relationship with Luffy in only a few panels. How both are so similar yet so fundamentally different at the same time. Loving your analysis series and can't wait for the Marine Ford review. Sarah is, I believe, a patron, so thank you for your continued support. And I'm glad you're enjoying the early access and the videos. But yeah, I, I do think that's something I haven't really talked about too much before is the efficiency of introductions. Blackbeard's, uh, Blackbeard's introduction right there is really beautiful in establishing both his dynamic with Luffy, the type of person he is, and the sort of um, divergences that could have extrapolated to that darkness. Another great one is uh, Nami's introduction, and uh, we see her fixation on stealing, and her fixation with money, and yet the clear heart that she seems to have. Uh, even Sanji's introduction, with the value of food and his uh, sort of principles that he tries to stick by, and all that great stuff in Baratie, just in general. Um, Luffy as well, Ace, uh, early on with Ace, he says a lot of things about being glad that Luffy has this new family. Uh, we only knew the beauty of that in the post-war arc, as we're going to talk about in this video. But uh, yeah, all in all, I think Oda's really impressive and has a great amount of foresight with regards to who these characters are, so that he packs a lot of detail and efficiency in these character introductions, in a way that I think helps for recontextualizing little lines that we may see earlier on. So yeah, great amount of planning, great amount of focus, uh, very rich. And Blackbeard's one of the best examples of that. Sanji Joestar says, Something I really like about Eva's quote on miracles is that they don't just happen just because you wish they did. Miracles happen through sheer will and never abandoning. And like you said, it speaks a lot about Luffy as a character. One example I can think of is his fight with Aokiji. Luffy knew very well he was no match for him, but still decided to fight him, to protect his friends and see the extent of his abilities and strength, I guess. But that determination to face Aokiji is also the reason why a crew with less than 300 million berries of bounty were able to escape an admiral. By pushing Aokiji to fight him in a duel, he was stuck in a situation where he couldn't pursue the rest of the crew without breaking his honor because the terms of the fight were that of a one-on-one. -on -one. And from here we go from justifying the survival by plot convenience to an actual driving force that Luffy creates. The story progressing thanks to the characters and not the plot making them progress unnaturally, if that makes sense. That's a really great way of putting it. Um, I mean, that idea is something I've thought about before and that I've talked about with other people, but uh, the idea of characters unnaturally progressing the plot through their actions, it being plot progression through character action, is a really cool way to put it, and I agree. Luffy being this force of nature of a character while also being very human, and how I always say that people can't help but get swept up in a storm, neither can the plot, neither can the story, or neither can this legend. And I love what you say about miracles as well, uh, that Eva says, they don't just happen, they don't just drop in your lap, you have to make your own luck. Miracles happen through perseverance and pursuing them. And so, this heaven-sent boy, Luffy, yeah, he seems to have this cosmic luck. 
yeah, he seems to be touched by fate in a way through through these through these miracles he experiences all the time. But have you seen a character who is more persevering, who goes more against the grain, who follows his dream, follows his heart any harder, who goes at the things he cares about more than Luffy? Is there anyone in the story as driven as this boy? No. So of course it makes sense that he is perhaps the luckiest character in the story. And extending that to another character, Buggy, uh, he is characterized by this immense perseverance, by this bizarre force of nature-esque charisma as well. So while I don't think he's quite as driven as Luffy, he's very driven. He's one of the most driven characters in the series regardless, and he has this charisma. And he gets exceedingly lucky a lot of the time, but these are things that he manufactures himself through his force of will. So I like that miracles and luck and all that are not defined as genuine just chance, randomly winning the lottery or something. They're defined as something that falls into the laps of people who try their hardest. And I think that's key. I think that's a big thematic distinction. Uh, not? Or notte? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Says Impel Down is always an interesting wrinkle in Luffy's morality. Luffy is at his core a good man, but his general ideology is dangerously and inherently selfish. Luffy didn't know what Arlong was doing. He went out of his way not to learn it. He fought for Nami. Same thing with Vivi and Alabasta or Robin and the whole lobby stuff. Debatably, even at Skypiea, his motivation was cricket. Here it's taken to the extreme. For Ace, Luffy helps some pretty genuinely awful people. It tends to work out because Luffy is good, but if it wasn't Luffy, if Luffy wasn't that kind of character, this is what those ideals could cause. And I'm not going to talk too much about this because a lot of it I talked about at the beginning of the AJP's comments. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a really... It's a factor of Luffy's character that I really like. He has never claimed to be a hero. He is a hero to some people. He is a villain to others. Justifiably so, given what he does in this arc. And Impel Down, I mean. He is just him. He does what his heart desires, he protects those he cares about, but no one in the world can be benevolent to sing every single person. And especially in a, in a setting like this, the bigger the action, the more repercussions they have. And when you're going against the world government, this, this uh, system that has this order, you're going to disrupt the entire, entire setting. And the depth of that effect is monumental. So with that in mind, yeah, imagine if Luffy had different motivations, different ideals. Kind of reminds you a little bit of Blackbeard uh, because of the way in which they, they diverge. And Blackbeard did go into Impel Down and steal prisoners for his crew and try to turn the world upside down. So I think Blackbeard's an interesting uh, way to look at this sort of topic. And also, once again, Buggy. Buggy has amassed this insane, insane uh, uh, support, this revolutionary support. Which makes me think, what's he doing post-time skip? Like, where has he gone in two years? Two years is a long time, considering how fast he amassed the support he has in Impel Down. He did that in the blink of an eye, comparatively. So where's he at now? So someone with his charisma and influence, without with more malicious intent than Luffy, Buggy and Blackbeard both seem to fit the bill. Buggy to a lesser extent, of course. That could be a hell of a storm. That could be a hell of an antagonist in the future. Um, and I can't wait to see where Oda goes with that. That divergence is a really cool idea. DP says, Your mention of Hannibal brought something to mind. He essentially said, You pirates are ruining this. The only safety and security we know. And you don't even care. That's why I hate you and won't surrender. I might be wrong, but it seems very telling, especially considering that we hear this and get this insight only when Luffy does. It leads me to believe that many more people of the world, pirates and navy alike, are aware of the flaws and problems with the current world order than we first thought. But we seem to only gain these insights as Luffy does. As if we, the audience, are made to be as naive as Luffy is, and we come to grow out of the naivete with him, at his pace. This seems to keep happening in the series in the way that many things and people are fantastical and whimsical and even silly, but every arc the seriousness of all this seemingly lighthearted world is revealed to us as it is to Luffy, via flashbacks, backstories of characters as far as Syrup Village, uh, Hachi and Kami, and Zabaudi Archipelago. No grand question, just a speculation and wanted to hear your thoughts. Thank you for the content, I appreciate you. Thank you. There are a couple of really interesting things in there. For example, you bring forth the idea that perhaps government officials and people know more than they seem to. Um, and just a few minutes ago, I talked about the idea that Hannibal may not know what he was talking about, uh, may not know the cruelty of the world government. So I'm not sure either way, but I think there's definitely a huge possibility that you're right and that a lot of people are aware and it's just us that aren't because of our perspective. And the way that that gradually fills in 
uh, the richness of the world, the depth of the political machinations at play here, um, some of the corruption, some of the moral ambiguity with what Luffy is doing, um, all that sort of thing. It's a great way to unveil the plot and setting and themes in a really organic way, like a, like a, uh, almost like a reader insert, an audience insert, but at the same time, not really. But because of Luffy's perspective and his single-minded nature at the beginning of the series, which is slowly broadened out, of course, uh, we learn at the same pace as him, and it's a great way to organically teach the audience these things. It's an interesting relationship with Luffy in that way. Am I growing out of naivete with him? I don't know. Could very well be the case. And the last comment is from Nine Lives, um, who has been a long-term fan and who has uh, uh, upgraded their Patreon tier recently. Uh, so thank you so much for the support. Thank you for sharing your story between uh, you and your friend, and that is incredibly special. And um, my condolences, and I'm so glad that these videos have been able to help you sort of reconnect in that way, or... Uh, find pleasant surprises of enjoyment in the story, and that just just generally that they've that they've helped you out a little bit. But they say one thing I've really grown to love about One Piece is the way that Oda takes the time to explore so many ideas. Sometimes it feels like it's at the expense of efficiency in his storytelling, but I think One Piece fans really value Oda's sort of meandering style of writing. He explores so many ideas and rarely forgets them. For example, the Laboon connection to Brook. This results in so many engaging plot lines and hooks that always seem to coalesce in exciting ways. Impel Down is another example of these ideas that have been cooking for hundreds of chapters coming together in insane ways. My questions for you are, do you think Oda sacrifices efficient storytelling for the sake of over-exploring ideas, or do you like his willingness to take time to expand on his ideas as he sees fit? Do you think this could eventually become too much down the line and result in a climax being bogged down by too many moving parts? Would you rather Oda get to the point in some, some cases, or are you happy to just be along for the ride in general? Thanks so much for the content, always a pleasure. Also, Mr. Tubon Clay, the Undisputed Goat. Amen. I'm actually glad this sort of question was asked because I answered something similar months and months ago, um, so it's cool to sort of come back to it with uh, hundreds of chapters more of context. So I definitely do agree with the idea that Oda really loves to dig into ideas and doesn't really mind if the story uh, would, in some cases for some people from their perspective, meander if the story is slower. I think that uh, Skypiea is a great example of that. If I'm skipping ahead a little bit, I think Fishman Island is actually a great example of that. So Oda definitely loves to hone in on these ideas and really explore all that he wants to explore about them. Now, to answer your question, do I think Oda sacrifices efficient storytelling, or am I happy with what he does? The answer is both. I would not want One Piece to be any different in style. I think it's a reflection of Oda as a person in the way that, in which he tackles all these different ideas, these sprawling ideas all over the place. I think it's great the vast majority of the time, and to me, it really doesn't bog down the pacing too much. However, sometimes it does when when I think Oda focuses on th some things that I find a little less interesting. So, speaking selfishly, in those moments, um, for example, uh, I do think that Oda focuses a bit more on fights that I find relatively thinner, that me personally, I would be down for him to cut those fights in half in terms of length. Um, I, I don't find them as interesting as other elements of the story. Um, so in those cases, speaking selfishly, yeah, I'd, I'd like Oda to be a bit more efficient. However, I wouldn't want Oda to cater this to me specifically, because then the draw of the series and why so many people love it would be totally altered. And I really like the idea that I have not read a story quite like One Piece ever before. While every part isn't fine-tuned to my tastes, I wouldn't want it to be, because my favorite works of fiction of all time, absolute like top five, top ten, those are the ones that are tailored almost every moving piece exactly to me. But you gotta step out of your box a little bit, and um, who knows, maybe I'll grow over time to like things in One Piece that maybe I didn't like before, or get used to them, or see some new way of viewing stories that helps me better appreciate that sort of thing. So in those moments, I do think there are some things that could be tightened up, a bit more focus, but at the same time, I wouldn't want Oda to change. Uh, his style. One Piece is a story I've grown super attached to, and I love that it's a reflection of Oda as a person, and I wouldn't want to dilute that in any way. So, the answer is both. There are moments where I'm like, uh, I wish this had been done differently, but at the same time, if that was at the expense of Oda's vision, nah, no way, don't do that. I'm just a random scrub on the internet with 
defined tastes that are a little bit different from some moments in One Piece, but I'm very much overall enjoying the whole package a ton, so I'm good. I'm very much an along for the ride type of guy. Anyways, thank you guys so much for all the AG piece questions. Uh, if you would like your comment to be used in a future video, just use the hashtag AJ piece and there's a chance that it'll be entered. But wow, post-war arc, essentially the perfect arc for the dust to settle after Marineford. Uh, this was fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed every single chapter for a variety of reasons. And in terms of themes and emotions and ideas, a lot of what I took had to do essentially with, well, first of all, just, just to put it out there, this, this arc fleshes out Ace a lot, fleshes out Ace and Luffy's relationship a lot, introduces us to Sabo, uh, delves into quite some really interesting political, uh, socio-political, hierarchical, societal things. Uh, so we'll touch on that as well. Um, just a lot of the class differences and how, how, the, the sort of binding limits, restrictions of being born into situations that are stifling, whether it be due to blood or whether it be due to societal restrictions as Sabo had. The way that he and Ace uh, reflect one another is really, really interesting and really, really effective. Um, but they are both restricted and want freedom, but we're restricted for different reasons. So their their dynamic's really interesting. Uh, but I'm rambling. Essentially, th one of the main themes I take away from this is the horrible, horrible state of the world and the towering authority and oppression that the aristocracy brings down upon those surrounding them in the lesser classes and the trickling byproducts of that. We've seen that throughout the series, but this may be the most upfront example of it yet. But like I said, it makes Sabo a good character. It makes Ace uh, an even better character. It does tons for Ace and Luffy's relationship. But most of all, and you must be screaming at your screen uh, because I haven't mentioned it yet, it makes Luffy a much better character. And he was already a fantastic character. It recontextualizes so many things uh, that he does earlier in the series. It recontextualizes his actual path and a lot of what he did and why he did what he did. And it wasn't that Luffy needed these extra layers, but now that I have them, like, holy crap, he is an amazing character. And as always, we'll delve into exactly why in the chronological story review, but I just needed to put that out there. This arc does so much for Luffy. Now, in terms of, in addition to the sort of uh, hierarchical political theme I was talking about earlier, there is also the main theme of freedom, what it means, um, and then outside of the flashback itself, the idea of moving on past pain, of crying and letting yourself feel grief and pain and agony but dusting yourselves off, carrying on the torch of those who have left us, and moving forward. It's okay to cry, but the point is you have to move on. You have to look forward once your eyes are dry. That's essentially what Shanks encapsulates in one of the first chapters of this arc, and he does it so beautifully, uh, in a way that really took my breath away. And in integration with that theme, this really... Ta also tackles the idea of understanding what you have and cherishing it and using the people and the connections you have and what you have to fight for to move on. Using that as empowerment to move on. Because Luffy has lost so much. He has lost his brother. He lost Sabo. Though, you know, Sabo is still alive, but he thinks he lost him. Um, he has suffered defeat after defeat. He's isolated from his crew. But nonetheless, they're still alive out there, and he truly believes that, and he still has them. And as long as he does, and as long as he has his dream, and as long as they're all pulling in the same direction, that is worth fighting for. It's a beautiful idea, that light beyond the darkness, understanding those around you and what they're worth, and using their connections to empower you to move forward integrating with that theme that Shanks brings forth. And lastly, the main theme I get of this is the importance of taking a step back, of taking a breath, of working hard on yourself or whatever you need to do, and then doing that to move forward and using your past pain and reframing it in a way that empowers you, encourages you to go forward, having learned from your past experiences. And what I mean by that is, I'm talking about it in very vague terms, but that's essentially the time skip. In this moment, after this momentous defeat, and all these failures from Luffy's perception, with all the crew separated, he made the decision, um, also fueled 
possibly by Rayleigh's advice, to tell his crew to train for two years, work on themselves, get stronger, prepare for the new world, because that's what's ahead of them. They need to. Otherwise, if they don't prepare, if they don't, they will just be repeating the cycle of pain and agony and loss. They need to be ready. So Luffy here tells them, we'll all take a step back, reframe your perspective, get stronger, gain new experiences and insight, become wiser, and then we'll join up again. And it'll be such a such agony to be away from these people that you love, but it's worth it. And we will join up again, and we will be all the stronger for it. And it's so important and symbolic that they rejoin at Sabaudi. Sabaudi was the site where Luffy began losing everything. He lost his crewmates, and, you know, we'll talk soon about how his past really recontextualizes that loss of his crewmates as even more devastating than I thought it was. But nonetheless, Sabaudi is the site of their pain. It associates, the Straw Hats associate Sabaudi with immense loss and heartbreak because it is where they were just completely out of their depth and it is where they, many of them, maybe all of them, could have died and there's trauma associated with it. But that is why meeting up in Sabaudi is so important because they come here, they're stronger, they're wiser, they're better individually and as a unit, and they are ready to take on the world. And meeting up in Sabaudi completely recontextualizes this place from one of pain and heartbreak to one where they use that experience to embolden them and they use their past experiences to look forward. This is their counterattack. Return to Sabaudi, Sabaudi is no longer a place of pain, it's a place of learning, and where they gathered to start the next phase of their journey. And I love that. So dense with so many themes, this is a great arc, uh, let's just get into it. So essentially, th this arc starts with, obviously, kind of like uh, how I alluded to, uh, the dust settling. The world sees the end results of the Paramount War at Marineford, and everyone reacts to Whitebeard's death and what transpired. And notably, the narration says, these people watch the dust settle on Marineford, and they all feel the coming of a new era of bloodthirst. A new era's coming. Um, is it going to be an era of Blackbeard, Doflamingo, Luffy? Who's to say, but an era of bloodthirst, that may indicate more so of the Blackbeard, Doflamingo variety. Nonetheless, it's really cool to see people at Sabaudi, uh, a lot of the supernova, uh, all reacting, because this shakes the world. But most notable among these to me is Kid, uh, Eustace Kid, who says that Blackbeard's now a force to be reckoned with, the four emperors better watch what they're doing. And he names Shanks, Kaido, and Big Mom. Big Mom is a new name and an interesting name for the fourth emperor that I didn't know about, but here's the reveal. Uh, Big Mom. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to make of that, we'll see. But Kid is very excited for this new turbulent era to begin, so I'll be keeping an eye on Kid for sure. But also, the knock-on effects of Whitebeard declaring that the One Piece exists, like I mentioned in the last video, sort of emboldens pirates everywhere to search for it, and it riles them up, and it kind of has a similar effect to what Goldie Rogers' death had, which is horrible, horrible for the world government, of course. But it leaves this power vacuum, and now pirates all over the place, this brown beard guy, um, they're emboldened, and they feel like they can be the next white beard, or they can take his territories, and it leads to all sorts of conflict and ho a bunch of horrible stuff happening as well. A lot of Luffy's friends and allies are on uh, Law's ship, and Bo is curious about how he is. Law says straight up that, you know, he's. I don't know if he'll survive. Obviously, he's going to, but this really shows how torrid a time he's having in terms of his health. Eva, Law, Boa, they all discuss these things and say, like, his spirit's been crushed, so it's gonna take a lot for him to bounce back from this. And notably, Eva asks Law, like, why did you help help Luffy? And he says, I didn't do it because I'm his friend. If you're interested in my motives, I could make up a reason. But that's really interesting how evasive he is about that. Um, he's such an enigmatic, really interesting figure, and I just want more from Law. But Eva says, you know, that's fine. Maybe you just helped instinctively, in which case that could be the case as well, and that could also tell us uh, about who Law is. Uh, but Eva doesn't need a reason. Eva's just grateful that Luffy is saved. But it's established that Jinbei will support Luffy through this, as he alluded to, and Luffy will be kept on Amazon Lily. Uh, Boa, Boa Hancock says that she will shelter him there, no problem whatsoever. And so the law of men being barred out from there is totally, is totally revoked. 
But just to do a little bit of housekeeping throughout the world, uh, Impel Down is in a state of disarray, obviously. Modulin is on the brink of death, but just about survives. Uh, Sengoku is obviously very devastated about all of this. His goals are being torn apart. And notably, Modulin is so upset by his failure here that he actually kind of intends to take his own life. Which Sengoku obviously says, no, don't let him do that, but... Wow, like, the weight of that. Level 6 is a shambles because Blackbeard has taken all these, uh, all these members and added them to his crew. And the Navy, the Marines, uh, are told by the world government that this must be covered up. This must be covered up because this getting out to the public would lose faith in the world government itself, again, controlling the narrative. Um, and right here we see a very big division between the world government and the Navy. I apologize because throughout these videos, I've kind of been referring to um, the Navy as part of under the umbrella of the world government. But it's clear there isn't, there's a division here. Um, so hopefully it came across that I know they're not the same entity, but they're associated. And I want to stress here that right here, Sengoku is very upset at the world government covering this up. He says this is absurd. So I wonder if this will continue to fracture as time goes on. But then we get to the most shocking thing of the first chapter here, and that is that Doflamingo has been told to kill Moria. He doesn't kill him, he instead just kind of beats him up, and then he says, go, flee, make yourself scarce, make it seem like you're dead, and you'll live a new life. But I got orders from someone on high to kill you, and it has to make it seem like you are dead. It'll be assumed that you died in the war, and Moria assumes that Sengoku asked him to do this, to cover these things up. But Doflamingo says, nope, someone even higher up than Sengoku asked me to do this. So, that makes me think, what is in it for him? Is he kind of puppeteering something with this person higher up? Are they even more insane than him? Like, what is his dynamic with this person higher up? I need to know that, because I'm so curious about Doflamingo and his era of the smile, and his ideals, and his jester-like uh, position. I'm so curious. And the fact that he is taking orders from someone higher up, um, his place on the world government is the result of this person higher up. He doesn't really care about his place in the world government. He likes being there so he can witness a lot of these things firsthand and revel in it. But he couldn't care less because uh, later he waves this as a threat. I could go off the world government. Uh, I could stop being a warlord. I don't really care. So really interesting stuff throughout the world. Lots of great hooks. But then we go back to the heart of this arc, and that is Luffy. He wakes up and just cannot accept that Ace is dead. He's still in that spot, still calling out for Ace. And one of my favorite ideas or themes of fiction that I might have talked about in these videos before, I'm not sure. I've definitely talked about it in my Breaking Bad videos, um, a couple other stories, but definitely Breaking Bad, is the idea of the morning after the nightmare. Because when devastating things happen in real life, in fiction, uh, whatever, it is like a nightmare. All these horrific things happen. The worst case scenario happens in a lot of ways. Uh, losing what Luffy lost in Marine Ford happens. These are like nightmares, they're awful. But to me, just as painful, or even more so, is waking up, metaphorically, the morning after, and realizing that it was not a dream. It was not a nightmare. Those things really did happen, and you have to pick up the pieces and live in this world with this pain. And these chapters capture this beautifully, as Luffy just sort of takes in the beauty, because it is a beautiful place, of Amazon Lily, and thinks, maybe it was all a dream, but it isn't. And he reflects on everything, on Ace, on his death, on all his pain, and he just keeps hurting himself and uh, lashing out and uh, tackling, tackling these trees and bloodying himself, reopening his wounds, because he just doesn't know what to do with himself. It obviously feels better for him to lash out, but it almost feels better for him to feel that pain, almost to punish himself for having been too weak. He thinks back to Akainu, he screams out, get off me. It's horrific to watch, it is so disturbing. And this, there have been lots of lows for Luffy, and I've, it's kind of become a meme, I've kind of talked about how this is the truest low. No, this is the truest low. This is the biggest low, right here. It, I can't imagine that Luffy will ever in the series again feel this low. And Jinbei kind of watches all of this and reflects again about what he internally promised Ace. And there is a lot of tough love here. He's empathetic, he's receptive to Luffy's pain, 
but he says some hard-hitting things that Luffy needs to hear. Yes, this is not a dream. Yes, Ace is dead. And Luffy just screams. This... This horrific, anguished yell of pain. And just cries. And cries and cries, it seems like for ages. And Jinbei just watches him. And we'll get more into how Jinbei approaches this later. But I'd just like to say right here that his presence here, and this approach, this mix between this reality, this realism that he has to get through to Luffy, and acknowledging and accepting and being receptive to his pain, it's perfect. But right here, we are sent into this backstory this uh, that is kind of the centerpiece of this arc. And we see uh, a younger Garp 10 years ago dropping off Kid Luffy with Dadan, who has already started taking care of Ace um, from before. And we have this faded meeting between two brothers. Uh, a little bit of rocky to start, but my goodness, every bit of that rocky path will stand them in good stead with regards to their relationship going forward. Uh, Dadan is also the head of a group of bandits as well. She's very kind of rough around the edges, very uh, kind of similar to Garp in that way, despite kind of despising him or saying outright that, that she despises him for leaving these kids on her doorstep, which is understandable. Um, but yeah, very rough around the edges, very kind of tough. Uh, definitely not afraid of making these kids go out and put in work, but nonetheless super heartfelt, uh, definitely cares, and again, there is love within that toughness. But Ace at this time, at this point in time, um, understandably because of his upbringing and, and everything, and uh, who he is as a person and what he's had to deal with, he's a very grumpy little kid. He doesn't want much to do with Luffy. He has this almost permanent scowl, this permanent frown. He's always angry. And Luffy just, it's its heartbreaking because uh, you understand why he's like this, but Luffy throughout all of this just wants to be his friend. And so he follows him all over this island, all over the place. Um, ends up getting beat up, almost eaten, uh, almost dies multiple times just to be with Ace, to be his friend. New injuries every time. It took him months. Uh, and he wasn't able to make any headway, but eventually one day, he made it to where Ace would go, which is Grey Terminal. This place, this trash heap of forgotten people, uh, forgotten objects, just garbage, according to society or higher society, uh, is tossed there. It's refuse. Uh, these people, these things, are not needed by anyone, again, in the upper society, and so, yeah, they're just tossed aside. It's beyond the reach of the law, there are no doctors, there's no healthcare or anything like that. Uh, it's always hot and stinky, and the sun reflects off the stuff there to cause this permanent uh, fumes, these permanent fumes. And it reminds me a lot of Meteor City, this place where the these people forgotten by society, tossed aside by society, have to make do, have to find some sort of living there. But Ace makes his way over to a boy named Sabo, that name we heard. Uh, when he was dying in Marineford. This boy who uh, was born to aristocrats but lives in Grey Terminal. And we very quickly learn that they are acting similar to bandits and stealing lots of stuff in order to gather the funds to one day become pirates and set off on their own on their own uh, quest of freedom, their own conquest. Because I'm getting ahead of myself but might as well just talk about it right here. Ace is restricted, he is limited by the life that his blood uh, leads him to live. Everywhere he goes, people scoff at him and they don't like him because of his uh, cursed up, because of his cursed blood, because he has the blood of Goldie Roger, who has caused lots of good, but also tons of bad, and lots of people hate him, and those people who hate him have been present throughout Ace's life. So he wants to transcend that, he wants to be free from that, which we know he eventually got, which is great for him for the years in which he was able to do that, and Whitebeard, it puts another great layer to Whitebeard. But, so that's his thing here. Sabo was born to an aristocrat, grown up in this stifling, horrible environment. He is stifled by his role as an aristocrat. He hates it. He sees the injustice, and from his perspective, perched up on high, he realizes the world needs to change and there has to be true equality. And he hates that he's been born into this role, and he wants to transcend that. And the effects he had on the story, oh my gosh, through, just through this pure dream, Oh man, we're gonna get there. But yeah, so I love the dynamic there. Him and Ace are kindred spirits in that way, and they reflect off one another despite having such different backgrounds. They are so alike. 
And they see Luffy here, Luffy trying to prove himself to be worthy of being their friend. So endearing, this child Luffy, uh, all that he does throughout this arc. And Luffy hears their secret because he makes his way over to them this time, and they say they gotta kill him, but none of them have the stomach to do it. Uh, they then come across Port Chemi of the Blue Jam Pirates, who say that that uh, Sabo and Ace are notorious here. And ultimately, Luffy is captured by these uh, by these people, and they want to question him about Ace and Sabo, uh, who are hiding. And there's some humor there as he goes like, help me Ace, and Ace is going, Why? he called my name, goddammit. Um, and he also says, Ace is my friend, but he just tried to kill me just now. Uh, so it's generally endearing, but also a bit sad. And Luffy is a horrible liar, so they see right through it. So they know they have some information to glean from him, and so they take him in. And they are not at all against torturing a child for this information. It is horrific. But no matter what he goes through, and Oda has no problem with presenting this in an uncensored way, Luffy, a child, uh, however old he was, uh, seven? Seven, eight? Um... We see him bloodied, beat up, completely tortured. It is beyond cruel, and yet he still does not give up Ace and Sabo. He's still loyal to them, despite them literally trying to kill him. That loyalty is so... It's, it's beyond endearing. It's beyond likable. It's just... It's beautiful. What a beautiful soul. And we knew that, but seeing this really puts it into perspective even more. And so Sabo and Ace come in, because they're good people at heart... They come in, and they save Luffy, and they, they fight off poor Chemi and the bandits, and they get him. Despite the repercussions, because those pirates are going to want even more revenge, uh, in addition to what they've been doing already. And Luffy is bawling, and a really kind of interesting element here is that, uh, an emotional element, is that Ace says here, Stop crying. Like, I'm sick of it. And Luffy tries consistently not to cry. Uh, tries and fails in a really loving, endearing way again. But that... That idea of not wanting Luffy to cry, it's important, so we'll come back to it. And Ace asks him, why didn't you give us up? These guys are beyond reprehensible, why didn't you give us up? And Luffy says, because if I did, I wouldn't get to be your friend. I have nobody else, and so I want to be your friend. These three people, these three boys, completely bereft of family, outside of, I guess, Dadan and uh, Garp, they are just a perfect fit for one another. And Luffy kind of says that he promised Shanks to be a great pirate. Uh, he, he tells that to to uh, to Ace. And that's where Ace kind of learns about Shanks. Uh, that's where this kind of motive is set out. It's it's put together here. And they, they say it outright. That after this, the three of us are going to be hunted by those pirates. They're in it together. So from this day on, Luffy joined in. And he was always following their backs. And the three continuing their exploits become infamous uh, throughout the Goa Kingdom, which is what this place is called. Which brings forth the attention of the Celestial Dragons. Uh-oh. I had no idea Luffy had any sort of background with the Celestial Dragons before, but this recontextualizes that punch to make it a little bit more powerful than it was even in that moment. And here we get an introduction to the actual kingdom of Goa. It's noted to be the most polished, clean, spotless, uh, bountiful, prosperous nation in the land, uh, or in the East Blue, excuse me. Which, you know, look at the contrast between that and Grey Terminal, like holy shit. Uh, the politics here speak for themselves. This disparity, this economic disparity, this cruelty at the hands of those viewed as lesser by those on top, and how the sort of economic system only perpetuates this further. This, is, this has led to immense pain throughout the entire world, but specifically here, and this is what Sabo and a lot of our characters, but Sabo specifically, hates and wants to eradicate. And one day when they are in the Goa Kingdom, the three, uh, stealing something, someone there recognizes Sabo. And so his background as this aristocrat boy uh, is revealed to Luffy and Ace, who didn't know this before. But yeah, he was never treated with love. He was always used as a pawn or a tool, and he had this role that he had to fulfill as a child, and he was just sick of it. So he left, and he took up residence in Grey Terminal. This kid who wants to just live his own life goes to this place where everyone is forgotten. Everyone's treated like dirt, like trash. That's, that tells a tale of its own, doesn't it? Simply because he didn't want to live this cold life set out for him, devoid of affection and warmth. Simply because he didn't want that. 
he becomes forgotten. That is his status. And so after telling them this, uh, the three kind of uh, vow, make, make their vows, where Sabo says, let's one day become pirates, reaffirm the pirate idea, so we can get out there and be free, transcend these shackles. He wants to navigate, Sabo wants to navigate, he wants to see the world, write a book about it, uh, detail it and chronicle his journey, and just make this make this beautiful, beautiful book of all the places he's been. A very Straw Hat-esque dream. So that's his dream. And then Ace says, um, no matter how many people in the world don't approve of me, no matter how many hate me, I'm going to become a great pirate and show them all. I won't run away from anyone. I won't lose to anyone. He's going to be strong. And he's going to make the whole world know his name. No matter how many people tell him that his name, that he shouldn't exist, he wants his name to perpetuate everywhere. Uh, so in direct contrast to the life he's been living. And then Luffy says it's his turn to proclaim his dream, and this is very interesting, because he goes, and every word here I think is very intentional and deliberate and important, in response to Sabo and Ace saying, I want to become a pirate uh, because I want to explore the lands and navigate and write this book, and Ace saying he wants to be strong and for everyone to know his name. In response to that, Luffy goes, okay, then I will which shows that it's contrast, it's not the same dream as theirs, which we know. But this is the point where he would usually say to anyone throughout the story, I want to be, and he does say that part, King of the Pirates. But here, Oda cuts it off, he cuts the flashback off and we don't hear what Luffy says. He says, I want to be, and then it cuts off. And then we see uh, Ace and Sabo just surprised, like, I can't believe you actually want to do that. And they're laughing at him. You're funny, Luffy. And that response would be understandable if he were to say, I want to be king of the pirates. I want to find the One Piece, etc. But I don't think that's what he said. Because Oda cuts him off. Why would he cut him off there? Why would he make that off screen? So, does Luffy have some alternate dream that has nothing to do with being king of the pirates? That's been part of his, his goals this entire time that he just hasn't spoken up about and that we don't see here. Maybe! Why else would Oda cut away from that? It's it's confused me since I read that, and I've just been thinking, and I don't really know. But it adds this new element to Luffy that's really interesting. It can't just be, I want to be free, because they all want to be free, uh, and that's not something they'd laugh at and say, like, that's a crazy dream, you know? So what is his dream? He wants to become the Pirate King, fervently. He wants to get the One Piece, all that stuff. But there's also something else, um, maybe a byproduct of that. Maybe the Pirate King is the means to the end. Like, we've talked about how being a Pirate King, through that end, the means was the goal in and of itself for Luffy. Because you are just so free, and, uh, and you experience such adventure and joy through pursuing that, right? So maybe it's something like that. I don't know exactly, but... It's a really interesting element, but after this, they all make their proclamation, and they say the three of us will always be brothers, so we have the full context to the scene earlier from Marineford of uh, them with their cups. If they drink from the same cup, they're brothers. Uh, I thought that was just for Ace and Luffy, but it turns out it's Sabo as well, so beautiful stuff here. And they make this proclamation, and they say they're brothers, and they continued on with their exploits. But then one day, Sabo's father comes to take him back, and he hires Blue Jam, uh, to that end. And he's a furious at uh, Luffy and Ace for having uh, influenced him to leave his home. And it seems like he's going to do something incredibly horrible to them. And to protect them, Sabo says, please take me with you. Please take me with you if you're going to spare them. And Ace and Luffy are furious, thinking that he's just giving up and not wanting him to leave. But he has to. Ace and Luffy are then taken in by the Blue Jam Pirates and they have to start uh, working for them and transporting uh, goods throughout Grey Terminal. Uh, for their needs to sort of make up for what they've done. Uh, it's, it's horrible. But Sabo then returns to his family, and he has this new brother, who is this horrible, horrible person named uh, Stary. And again, this, his home is exactly what you'd expect. Uptight, uh, they're pigeonholed into these roles, they, they, there's no affection, and it's just horrible. It, it is exactly what you would expect from the aristocracy in this setting. And then it's revealed to Sabo that Grey Terminal will soon go up in flames. It is planned for this place to be burned down. And the goods that Luffy and Ace are transporting throughout end up actually being the explosives to take this place down. This place is going to burn. Even the people are gonna gonna burn, and Sabo realizes this and learns this and needs to warn his brothers. And what shocks him, almost as much as the fact that this is happening, is that he goes around town and warns people and tells them, 
and everyone knows. And yet they don't bat an eye because it's not their problem. It's someone else's misfortune. It has nothing to do with them. This place is so completely bereft of compassion and kindness and empathy and just warmth that it's so upsetting to to Sabo. And so he needs to make sure that Luffy and Ace are okay. And we learn that Blue Jam did this because it was promised that if he did, he would become an aristocrat. That was his dream, to live in the Highland, uh, uh, I think is what it was called, um, to live in Highland and to carry out his dream of just living lavish, living comfortably, living like the people on high. That was all he wanted, and he was going to burn down Grey Terminal for it. He ended up being double-crossed, and Luffy and Ace uh, and him, they're all caught in this, and it's heartbreaking, and right here, we see Ace tell Luffy, as Luffy is coughing in the smoke, he tells Luffy, don't worry, after this, I'll take care of you. That is kind of the precursor for what happens after this. And Sabo just almost fruitlessly, almost in futility, goes around and is screaming, Luffy and Ace, run away, get out of here. And he's just beside himself with rage and grief and panic, and he's just crying. And he says out loud, the aristocrats did this, these people did this. If I stay here, understanding this corruption, I will never be free. And all he wants is to be free. And he's stopped by this cloaked person who says, what's wrong? And he says, I'm ashamed to have been an aristocrat. This world is broken, and it's dragon. The person is dragon, and this changes dragon. He says, you've caused this boy to despise his own kind. This completely changes Dragon, and it's unbelievable the way in which it does. Uh, he is shocked at this, and he says, I understand. I was born in this country too, but I still don't have the power to change it. And Sabo says, what I said matters to you? And he says, of course, I will never forget it. So we know Dragon is this revolutionary. I think it's implied that he was a revolutionary before this, so it's not like Sabo's words be make him become the revolutionary, but it definitely tr turned the tide and made him be more proactive. It changed his life, and that is amazing. Again, this little act of shame at where he's come from, and Luffy's father resolves to change this. There's there's a great amount of poetry there, and Blue Jam's a, quite an interesting character. Uh, he was so enamored and taken in by the promise of this luxury, of this peace and this splendor, and just a lazy, beautiful life, so much so that he didn't even realize he was being double-crossed, and then he, in his despair, he wants to take Luffy and Ace down with them. He says, let's just all die together. This world is broken. We're gonna die, let's die together. Misery loves company. But unlike his despair, Luffy and Ace hope for more. With his experiences with the nobles, he says that Sabo probably just looked down on Luffy and Ace the whole time, but they never believe that. They say there's no way he would ever do that. And they're right. They just go, Sabo just wants to be free. And they're both being, you know, physically assaulted, basically, by these pirates. And Ace, in this moment, seems to use hockey in trying to defend Luffy from them. Uh, in a way, there's a beautiful mirror to how Luffy used hockey in Marineford to try to save Ace. Same thing happened, just a reverse, ten years ago. Beautiful stuff. And then right in the nick of time, Dadan shows up to save the day and save Ace and Luffy. And Dadan says, let's run, we gotta run away. But Ace says, I will never run away. Even as a kid, he never wanted to run away. Just like he was as a kid, he is as an adult. He would never have run away from a Kainu. And he didn't run away back here. Again, more cohesiveness, mo more coherence for Ace's character. He was always like this. So of course he acted the way he did against a Kainu. And so Dadan and Ace face off against Blue Jam. And Dragon and the Revolutionists come and save the town. They blow out the fire, there is destruction, but they save it. In a way very similar to how Shanks ended the war at Marineford. And we see here, we see Eva, which is lovely to see him. But we also see Kuma. Again, more crumbs for Kuma's character. You guys know how interested I am in him uh, going forward with regards to him in the plot, uh, his backstory, all that sort of thing. So another Kuma crumb right here, beautiful stuff. And I love what this does for Dragon and how it substantiates him. Dragon has been, I've kind of been waiting for him to cook and he's starting to with this flashback it's a great flashback for him, as well as Sabo, Ace, and Luffy. And he says, This nation is the future of the world in miniature. A world where unwanted things are discarded can never truly be happy. I will change the world one of those days. And so we think back to what Eva said, or that, that flashback Eva had, where he was yearning 
for something beyond the sea. Maybe he was yearning for Luffy, maybe he was just imagining the world he wants to create. Maybe he was thinking about Sabo. Whatever Sabo's doing, because we don't know. We know he survives and was taken in by Dragon, but what happened after that? We don't really know. So, a lot of weight added to Dragon here. But then Sabo, sick of this, transcending his, his boundaries, decides to set sail, to become a proper pirate. He is sick of it, and he's gone. And in the midst of this, there's, there's just this one line that sums everything up about Oda's thoughts on this sort of attitude and these sorts of politics. This aristocrat, uh, Sabo's father, says, Your mother and I give you life. It's your duty to please us. You should find happiness in that. Don't you agree? At that point, he's done. He's out of there. And he sets sail. Sabo decides that he, what he fears most in this world is being swallowed up by this nation and losing sight of who he is. He doesn't want to become someone he hates, and so he decides to leave, to pursue his dream. He's done with it, and he pens this letter to Ace and Luffy telling them, and I'll read an excerpt from it in a second, but as he is setting out on his little boat, the celestial dragons come in, or sorry, a world noble, and seeing this as a smirch upon their, their authority, uh, their pride, they can't let this unsightly little ship be in their way, so they destroy it. They dispatch of it. And the last we see of Sabo there is his feared face in the face of this destruction as cannonballs rain down on his boat. And someone on uh, Dadan's crew, uh, what's his name? Dogura? Witnesses all of this. He sees all of this and so he knows what happens to him and he knows that he's likely dead. Luckily, Ace and Dadan come back, um, not unscathed, but alive. And here there are some evil lines here. Luffy is Delighted to see Ace back, obviously, but he's crying because he was so scared and he thought he was dead. And he says, Did you think I was dead? What are you crying for? How dare you kill me off, you idiot? That hurts just a little bit extra. And Dadan asks Ace, Why didn't he run away back there? And more fuel to the fire, pardon the pun, of the type of character he is. He just doesn't run away. He says, Sometimes I get so angry, and I feel like if I run away, I'll lose something I could never get back. And this time, Luffy was behind me. That's probably the reason. This nature to protect. He wanted to protect Luffy there, he wanted to protect Whitebeard in Marineford. And when Garp he hears of this, he says, wow, he's a lot like his father. Goldie Roger, that's him in a nutshell. And one time he destroyed an entire army of a nation because they talked bad about his friend. Interesting, I wonder if that'll be flashed out later. But either way, that is Ace in a nutshell. He grew up the same way as Ace. Um, he lived recklessly. And what Garp says is that he, society saw him as a great criminal, but his friends trusted him completely. Like father, like son, as much as Ace hates that, he is like his father. And how sad is it that he was never able to transcend that properly? He died because of that blood. But maybe Luffy and maybe Saba will be able to live for him and transcend that. But Dogura tells them about what he saw. And it's just heartbreaking. There's disbelief, there's grief. They think now, so you weren't happy where you were. They regret why they didn't try to get him back. Luffy balls, and, and Ace immediately wants to kill him, and Dadan says, no, like, what are you doing? There's no way you could do anything here. But that futility, that uselessness is what really hits. He wants to avenge him, just like he wanted to avenge Whitebeard in a way. But there's nothing he can do. And Dadan says, it's this nation that killed Sabo. It's this world. Do you think you can do anything about the world? Your father died and changed the entire era. Become as big a man as him before you even think of getting yourself killed. That is what Dadan says to him. And I love it because it's kind of similar to Jinbei. A mix of realism, tough love, but love nonetheless. Because it's a challenge. It's not saying you will never become like Roger you'll never be able to change this world. It is, you have to get much stronger before you do, because that is the weight of the enemy you face. And so it's not, you'll never be able to do this, it is, you have to get much stronger. You can do this, but you have to learn. You have to grow. And, but Ace obviously doesn't realize that in the moment, uh, contemplating the death of his brother, and Luffy is bawling, crying, and he says, shut him up, a man should never cry. And so, Dogura gives Ace the letter that was sent out. And it's just it just encapsulates their relationship and their goals. And it says, basically to Luffy and Ace, I'm going out to set sail and explore the sea. I hope we meet someday. My destination is anywhere but here. 
pirates are freer than anyone in the world, so I'm gonna become one. And he says that his brothers are his greatest treasure. Um, and he says, Phew. wow. And he says to Ace, you know, Luffy's a crybaby, but he's still our little brother, so take care of him. And that is when Ace cries, when he's alone. When he's away from everyone, he allows himself to cry. So the two resolve to become stronger, so that they will never lose anyone like this again. And Ace says, Remember this, Luffy, I'm not gonna die. That is the promise, he said, that was unfortunately broken. He says, Sabo told me to take care of you, so I'm not gonna die. I'm not gonna leave you behind. And this is when Ace says, Sabo lived without freedom, so we have to live it for him. We have to live our lives without any regrets. We'll be freer than anybody, and we'll take on the sea, we'll take on Gramps. My god, these words hit so hard. But I talked about Luffy and how this arc really makes him an even better character and elevates him. And that is through his words here upon losing Sabo. He says, I want to be lots, lots, lots stronger so there won't be anything I can't protect and nobody will have to ever go away again. That is why he protects his friends in the way he does. It's just part of who he is, but this experience has informed the way he acts in that way. That's why he does this, a huge part of why he does this, so no one will ever go away again. That is his greatest fear, and that fear happened at the end of Sabaudi. He experienced it, that was his nightmare becoming a reality. His nightmare from all the way back then, 10 years ago. I don't want anyone to ever go away again. Literally, his friends go away, or literally disappeared. So, imagine the despair he felt. A hundredfold. This is something he has feared since he was a child, and he set himself out to become strong to protect. And he realized it was all futile in that moment. He realized that his goal to not lose people, to become stronger, he just didn't do enough. It was Sabo all over again. The trauma all over again. And that just adds this whole new layer of depth to Luffy, this tragedy to Luffy. That is unbelievable. This flashback just really helps you see why Luffy views the world the way he does. Why he has these dreams to be free. Because this is what he wanted his entire life. He wanted to transcend this. Uh, his, his dream to be free, to become the Pirate King as a byproduct of that to be free. To protect his friends, to have a crew, and to not let them go away. Also, someone pointed out to me that the first time he sees Kobe, he says, Don't cry because I hate crybabies, I hate weaklings. Nice little uh, throwback to Ace. But yeah, wow. What this does for Luffy, incredible. And then we see that someone severely wounded has been brought on the ship uh, with Dragon. So this person who changed Dragon's life in some sort of way is now taken in by Dragon. Now, what happens with their relationship? What happens with Sapo? We don't know. And Luffy th and Ace thought he died, but he didn't. So, really interesting little plot thread going on in the background there. But what's really cool is we also see Zoro and Queena training in the midst of this, uh, where it seems like Dragon and his crew took up port there, uh, at their home. So that's really cool too. Nice little Easter egg. There's some horrific sadness as uh, Luffy and um, Ace would kind of fight and train and whatever, and they would they were so used to Sabo's presence that they just go, oh, right, Sabo? And then realize the truth of the matter. It's so gutting. We then see Makino from uh, who we haven't seen in a while, and it's lovely to see her kind of get closer to these boys. Uh, and ultimately, they train, the years go by, and they they decided once we turn 17, we set out. Ace sets out, and what I think is really notable is that those three years for Luffy must have been hell. Not hell, but just tormenting. Because how desperate must he and impatient must it must he have been to go out with Ace, uh, to go uh, Ace getting this head start sort of uh, that element of competition which Luffy is uh, ingrained in. So it must have been so difficult for him to see that and not be able to go out himself. But his patience and his ability to stick to their agreement speaks volumes of his conviction and his principles. It was a promise, and he fulfilled it, despite how hard it must have been. Then eventually it's Luffy's turn too, Dadan being very emotional at both of their goodbyes. But this is chapter one, from a different perspective, and he says something we didn't see before, Look at me, Sabo. I'm going out to sea too. Sabo was first, Ace was second. I ended up being third, but I'm not going to lose to them, and I'll catch up to you, Ace. I'm going to be King of the Pirates. And that was this declaration of war, kind of, against the world. And the flashback ends, and we go back to his despair. As he thinks of that, 
thinks of his declaration, thinks of all that he lost and all that he tried not to lose to become stronger to not lose, and lost it anyway. And he despairs and says, I am so weak back in the present. Now, in Fusha Village, Dadan and Garp are reunited in the present, and Dadan attacks uh, Garp in rage after Ace's death. And Garp doesn't fight back. There's a look in his eyes of acceptance, as if I deserve this, similar to Luffy, like grandfather, like grandson, right? And Makino stops Dadan from attacking him and very intuitively goes, he, those two were within his reach, but he couldn't save them. He is chastising himself and punishing himself internally more than anyone. But then Dadan, while accepting that, says no, he's not hurting more than anyone. Luffy is. And it brings a tear to Makima's eye. And, uh, and Dadan's right. Dadan's absolutely right. Garp informs the island about what happened to Luffy and his state. And Dadan lets out this scream and goes, Luffy, don't let anyone beat you. Then, wow, the emotions keep coming. By the way, 590, which is the chapter I'm talking about right now, is my favorite in the series. It is my favorite full stop, I think. Because we then go to this memorial for both Whitebeard and Ace that Marco and, uh, that Marco and Shanks erect out of respect for them, not letting them die in disgrace. Shanks oversees this, and he makes sure it's done right. And he thinks to himself, the main theme here, I think, Luffy, I know you're in a lot of pain right now. I was surprised to hear what Ace did for you. It's exactly like what Roger would do. I wish the captain would run away or let himself cry sometimes. Listen, Luffy, you grow up and become a man by experiencing victory and defeat, by doing difficult things and shedding tears. It's all right to cry, just overcome it. So he believes in him. Shanks absolutely believes that Luffy will overcome this, and the promise will be fulfilled. Not today, not tomorrow, not even next year. But one day, Luffy will be that strong pirate. And he knows that he can move on from this, and he can't see him, and that must pain him beyond belief. But they had a promise, and he believes in him. I just sat back and looked at this, looked at this page in silence for forever. It was so overwhelming. It just... It's just everything... Everything about it is so beautiful. But then Luffy, back to Luffy, I couldn't protect anyone, and he keeps hurting himself, and Jinbei says, stop it, I'm not gonna let you keep doing this to yourself. I'll, I'll take on your rage, if that's what it takes for you to calm down. I will take it, but you have to face reality, and you have to move on. And we see another flashback to Jinbei and Ace, where Ace says, I was relieved to see that Luffy had these friends. And so that connects here, where Jinbei and Luffy are reflecting on what he does have. He've, he's lost his brother. He feels so weak, but he is still alive. And as long as he is, he has something still to protect and search out and find and then pursue a dream with. And that is his crewmates. Don't dwell on what you've lost. Dwell on what you still have. Remember that. Hold it deep within you. Cry, wipe your tears, move on, and then remember what you still have to protect. And that is his crew. In one of the best spreads of the whole series, we see Luffy crying, but a little bit of a glimmer of hope in his eyes. I still have my crew, as we see them all smiling in the back. The best chapter of One Piece, I think. My favorite. And I don't really have much to add to that, because this is the theme. This is it in a nutshell. This is why One Piece is this optimistic work, because even in the depths of despair, there is always something to protect, there is always a light to strive for. And that's what Oda's been setting up this whole time. This is the darkness, but this moment is where Luffy completes his comeback, or begins his comeback, rather. And he needs to see them, he wants to see them right now, which I think makes it even more admirable that he's able to wait two years to do so, because it's the best decision for all of them. Similar to how he waited three years after Ace departed to go out himself. And it's very cute. Uh, Luffy being as injured as he is, Jinbei's carrying him everywhere. Uh, but Luffy meets up with Rayleigh. Uh, Law has left, which is a bit of a shame, but that's alright. Jinbei's fanboying a bit at seeing Rayleigh, which is adorable. And then we learn that Rayleigh and Shaki uh, and Old Lady Neon took the sisters in after that those horrible events uh, 13 years prior, which is really cool integration that obviously wouldn't have come up before, but makes sense that it is now. And then we learn that... Kuma told Rayleigh, I'm a leader of the revolutionaries, and I want Luffy to escape this place. Not just Luffy, but the Straw Hats overall. So it's confirmed here. In what may have been the last act of his life, 
Kuma straight up says here, I don't have much time left, so with the last vestiges of his life, wanted to save the Straw Hats and told Rayleigh this, because he was going to be overtaken by whatever this pacifista system robot thing was. And then Rayleigh has a suggestion for Luffy to meet uh, after hearing that he wants to meet with his friends. And after this, we see a nice snapshot of all the Straw Hats. Uh, Usopp at the Island of the Giant Bugs. Uh, we see Frankie. Um, Usopp's gained quite a bit of weight, which he then works off during the time skip. Uh, and turns into muscle. Uh, Chopper, Nami, Robin, Frankie, everyone is at their own island and they're learning through the newspaper of something that Luffy has done, which comes to them through this newspaper and through this news. And Oda really milks this. He really builds up. They're going, whoa, Luffy would do that? Holy crap, what's going on? And it's all generally really good. The two I want to draw attention to is that Zoro is now kind of being mentored a little bit by Mihawk, who takes up residence at the island where Zoro and Perona are. Gloom Island, he took up residence there a few years ago, which is awesome. Um, but Zoro needs to train to get stronger, and the implication here is all the Straw Hats need to build themselves up, be ready for something down the line. Um, so the Zoro part is really nice because of the Mihawk touch, but the Nami scene really got to me. Learning of what happened to him at Marineford, she goes, Ace died right before his eyes and I didn't even know about it. He'll definitely go to our rallying point that we agreed upon at Sabaudi. And she cries, and that's implied to be some sort of crocodile tears so that she can get what she wants out of, the, out of this island, out of the people on the island. But as she's running away, uh, this wizard-ish looking guy goes, Why are your crocodile tears still there? Showing that she is deeply affected by this, even still. And sh what she said was in fact the truth. And each of the Straw Hats have their own respective things to learn about. Usopp physically, Zoro uh, through under the tutelage of Mihawk. Uh, Nami's gonna learn more about the weather and develop that way. Uh, Frankie can learn technological feats from Dr. Vegapunk, um, the, the remnants of Dr. Vegapunk. So each of them has their own thing. But Robin, specifically, is told um, at the island that she's at, uh, what is it called again? Oh, and she's just atop a huge giant bridge. Uh, men come to her and say, we are here to protect you under the orders of Dragon. And she goes, thank you. Um, I'll meet with Dragon, but... I have my own friends, I don't need this protection. But nonetheless, Robin goes for two years to learn from Dragon. There's a bit of a hook for this bridge being built. Uh, the Celestial Dragons ordered it to be built. Robin asks about it. This guy, this, this official says the purpose isn't important, but a lot of people have died in its construction. That could be just some thematic things to, to tie on to the societal, sociopolitical, hierarchy, economic disparity differences that are tackled through the, uh, through the flashback. Maybe? Or maybe it's important for something down the line, I'm not exactly sure. But nonetheless, really cool stuff for Robin too. Eva goes back, and uh, Eva's back to the Kamabaka qu uh, Queendom, and Sanji's going to be there to learn from them. And then we get a lovely little hint, um, hook, as Eva calls Dragon up, and they say there's a- they, they talk a little bit about the, the destabilization of the world after Whitebeard's death, but they also talk about we need to talk about something to do with Kuma. He isn't the same Kuma anymore, he tried to kill Eva, but they still need to talk about it. And like, what's going on with him? That's exactly what I'm thinking. So, they talked about it here, and Oda again off-screened it. Hopefully we'll get into it pretty soon. And then, the new cyborg Kuma seems to appear before Shaki, who says, you're on our side, right? So, something is cooking there. Uh, we also see a very nice little way to catch up with Sir Crocodile, who is now with Mr. One, seems to have embraced the idea that he needs friends, he needs these connections to properly pursue his goals. And I kind of wondered, would Whitebeard dying me make him a bit listless, a bit aimless, a bit ponderous? Would this leave him in a limbo, or would he have a new and renewed purpose in, in the face of it? He seems to have a new and renewed purpose. He and Mr. One together are going out to the new world. It's awesome stuff. He has lost his cynicism. He seems to have hope there. He has this great grin. Awesome stuff for Sir Crocodile. Buggy reunites with his crew and finds a way to uh, Captain John's treasure mark. And they all say, you know what? That's our next destination, or that's their next goal. And Buggy says something that really encapsulates his character, and that is, do you know which way the wind blows in this world? Not east or west. It blows for me. And Mr. Three is with him. 
notably. So they're kind of taking up arms together. They're kind of together. They've got a bit of a partnership going, which I really like. I really like what's going on between those two. But what Buggy says there is kind of encapsulative of what Mihawk said about Luffy, kind of what I talked about in Marineford. The wind blows for him. I can't wait to see what Buggy will do in the time skip going forward. Uh, what's his role going to continue to be? The world continues to react to this, to this crazy news. We, we, we check in with Smoker, the world government, uh, the elders. They are concerned deeply about Blackbeard and the fact that he's uh, consumed two devil fruits. They're worried about those with the name D, Marshall D. Teach, Monkey D. Luffy, uh, Port God's D. Ace was a thorn in their side, obviously, Gold D. Roger. So they're concerned about Blackbeard, people with the name D. They're wondering how to go forward and how to deal with the threats that are posed to them. We then learn that Garp has resigned from his post as a member of the Navy possibly in response to what he had to do in service of what he represented. Maybe he wants to help out the world in some other way uh, that doesn't hinge so much on his reputation and his necessity to do things that he hates. Maybe. I don't know exactly. But, oh man, it's really interesting that he does this, because I wasn't expecting it. He's going to stick around to train some young officers, but he's done after that. But in addition, Sengoku steps down. Maybe due to his uh, conflicts with the world government and how he, it may have been the final straw for them to cover up uh, a lot of what happened. He was very upset about that, so maybe that's why. So he steps down from his role as Fleet Admiral, and he suggests that Admiral Aokiji become the next one. Aokiji, one of the most interesting characters in the story. Have they got some plan going on here? Like, he has never fully aligned with the world's government and the Navy's way of doing things. He's always been a bit different. So him being the leader of the world government going forward, or sorry, of the, of the Navy going forward, is so enticing. I can't wait to see what he's going to do with that power. How he could reshape things, maybe. Smoker, my guy, he wants to go to the New World. So it's like, it's very reminiscent of Logtown here. Whereas at the end of Logtown, Smoker, Dragon, all these people, Buggy, were all going to go to the Grand Line. Now everyone's congregating to go to the New World, uh, with, which is what Luffy wants to do too. Very Logtown revin reminiscent, which is cool to check in with all these different factions and all that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot more this time around, which is why it takes multiple chapters, but nonetheless, I love this stuff. We also learn that Kobe has awakened to hockey. He says he feels the presence of everyone around him so strongly. He has some sort of sense, very similar to Isa in Skypiea, um, who seemed to have been using Mantra. And so I did think it was a bit strange that he was being able to sense people's uh, voices disappear one after another, just like Isa. But I thought that just might have been Oda being very dramatic and flowery with his storytelling. I don't know. I kind of just thought it was a little something that I kind of raised an eyebrow at and then just continued on. But it turns out the reason he heard that was because Kobe has awakened his hockey, which is so cool. Awesome. And again, more of a foundation for Kobe to see where he is in two years. Where does he go with this power? And we then learn that Luffy did what he did, what everyone was shocked about, was he traveled around Marine Ford once and then rung the bell 16 times. It's usually done in in a very sort of funeral procession sort of way, as respect for the dead. But he did it here 16 times instead of two. Killer says that this is uh, a custom that's done to signify that the new era has begun. Whereas Kid sees what he's doing and he's going, oh, he's trying to claim this era as his own? Oh boy. And he, we see this crazy ass page of Kid saying that if you're not prepared to die, don't come to these waters with all these grotesque corpses around him. I have no clue what his role is going to be going forward, but my god, he looks super antagonistic and villainous here. And he seems to be doing that in the new world, so that's to come. But I spent a few minutes trying to work out what this message would have been just with these hints. I, I kind of got a little bit close. It had to do with... He was sending a notice out to his straw hats, obviously, but I couldn't really get it. In the end, what it ends up being is he has this tattoo, uh, very similar to Ace's, which I don't think I mentioned before, but the A-S-C-E, the S with the cross out, the kind of being, uh, could also be construed as the skull and crossbones, that whole thing, awesome stuff. But Luffy here has this tattoo that says 3D2Y with a 3D crossed out. And what that essentially means is we were supposed to meet in Sabaudi three days uh, after three days, but instead let's do two years. Train, become wiser and stronger, and we'll meet in two years. Meanwhile, a lot of the supernova are going to the new world. Hawkins, uh, Uruj, uh, Killer, Kid, you know, a lot of the supernova are going there. So the congregation continues. 
Meanwhile, Blackbeard is also in the New World with his crew, trying to take the world by storm. And he has Bonnie captive, and he is saying, you know, be my wife, let me take you as my woman. He is just disgusting. The way seeing him interact with Bonnie in this way really made my skin crawl. And having her captive, that's obviously some sort of seed that's being planted. So I mentioned earlier, I think in uh, Marine Ford, about the fact that Bonnie seems to have some connection with what happened at Marine Ford, or something to do with that. Um, maybe this is a precursor to that. Either way, it made me, oh, my skin crawled at Blackbeard here. Just absolutely heinous. Uh, get your hands off her, man. Like, holy shit. But what actually ends up happening here is that a Kainu comes to... Who's to say what he's gonna do with Bonnie, but he comes to get her. And he says, a cold chill ran down my spine when I heard you ran away from the government. So she has ties to the government somehow. But it seems like that, that hint was not just a red herring or anything like that. So we'll see where that goes. But Blackbeard, knowing that he can't stand up to a Kainu, runs away. So Bonnie ends up being in a Kainu's clutches. Then we see Doflamingo communicating with someone who's shrouded in shadows. Uh, they're talking about the, the, the sort of the state of the world, about Blackbeard, um, kind of about Moria as well, uh, since he was ordered to kill Moria for him. And Doflamingo goes, since when did you become my boss? I don't care how much pull you have with the government, I'm a pirate. That has nothing to do with me. If I lose interest in our little deal here, I can quit being one of the seven warlords any time, don't you forget that. So kind of what I was talking about earlier. Doflamingo does not, uh, he doesn't, he isn't invested in being a warlord. He's doing it for someone else, for this person who is not shown to us. And it really makes me curious, like he seems to have authority over them. Maybe he doesn't lord over them, maybe he isn't superior to them technically, but he is comfortable with speaking his mind in front of them. So they don't have complete authority over him. Maybe he's using them. Maybe it's mutually beneficial, but Doflamingo is using them. Either way, I want to know who this person is. But then with all that done, we go throughout all the different islands. Uh, we see all the Straw Hats and we reflect to each of their moments where they became part of the crew how Luffy brought them in. And it's extremely moving. It's extremely emotional. It's lovely that Oda did this to, short, to sort of show, this is where we are. Where are we going to go from here? But nonetheless, their bond will never be affected. It'll never be shaken. And I'm not going to go through each one because they're all just beautiful encapsulations of how each of the characters are, who they are, their bonds with Luffy and all that. But Robin says something really interesting as she heads out to be part of uh, Dragon's crew for a little while. And she goes, this is the first time I ever wanted to be stronger for someone else's sake. Very beautiful. And Usopp thinks to himself, I always thought that Luffy would become the Pirate King on his own. But no one can live alone like that and achieve those sorts of things. Not with a challenge ahead of us. So I need to help him. He takes on this responsibility and he embraces it. And he says he's going to become courageous, the real Sniper King. And I kind of got ahead of myself. I guess Zoro asks Mihawk here to teach him what he knows. Uh, so he's not properly being mentored by him, but at this point, he kind of is. And he says that he wants to surpass him one day, which, oh man, the Badatie crumbs. But the goal is set. Two years at the Sabaudi Archipelago, everyone is to meet stronger, wiser, more experienced, with a greater perspective. And Luffy is about to do some training on this island uh, that uh, has a bunch of ferocious beasts there, all of which are 50 times more powerful than Luffy or 500 more times more powerful than Luffy. Rayleigh tells him this, and this is where Luffy will train. Rayleigh, Luffy, they're gonna train here, it's awesome. It's very Star Wars, Yoda, Luke Skywalker-esque. And he is here to teach Luffy about hockey. He tells him that it's a dormant power lying within everyone. Everyone possesses it to some degree. It just kind of has to awaken. And there are different types of hockey. Three, one is to observe uh, and sense uh, an opponent. And that's the power of observation hockey. It's a sort of awareness. It allows you to feel and observe and understand the environment and what's going on around you. A greater awareness, generally. And that is similar to Mantra from Skypiea. Now, let me just toot my horn a little bit, because I did wonder if Zoro used Mantra there uh, at the end of Alabasta, and if that was showing that he was the first one on screen to use hockey. Turns out he wasn't. There are situations before that. But I am a tiny bit proud that I was able to pick up on that. So, uh... Yeah, a little, little bit of satisfaction with that one. That's really cool. But there's also arms hockey. It's like an invisible suit of armor, which strengthens you, builds you up, good defense. And throughout this, we see flashes of how this has been applied throughout the story, which is really cool. But then he says in some situations, people can manipulate and use a third power. Conquer is hockey. Hockey of the king, which is what Luffy has used. And this one is special. 
Exactly how and why in the applications, we don't know exactly yet, but if Luffy harnesses this, it'll be a sight to see. It's the power to overwhelm, as said by Rayleigh. All the people in the world who've who have made a name for themselves possess this power, so is it something that indicates that someone will become someone of wide repute, uh, widely known? Who's to say? Maybe it's an, Maybe there's an element of fatalism to that too. Cosmic luck. I don't know. Uh, definitely a lot of interesting thematic notes to do with fate there. Uh, but Luffy's used that multiple times, so he's going to train that. And throughout all this, Rayleigh makes it clear our training is going to be very difficult, and Luffy is up for it, because he needs to be able to get the power to protect his friends, and he needs to continue on with his journey, but he is now fully aware and cognizant of the challenge ahead of him. So he takes his hat, he sets it down, and he says, let's get started. And that is the last pre-time skip chapter. Two years later, he's able to pick this up, having grown stronger, his character design a bit more muscular, the scar looks awesome. Uh, you know, uh, a constant reminder, I think, of what happened, but also just looks kind of badass. I don't mean to lighten the mood with something that's a very serious thing, a serious emotional thing that happened to him, but it looks awesome, I can't lie. And it's just so much fun, it's so cool to see all the Straw Hats reuniting at Sabauti, at this place, and again with this lighter complexion, more encouraging, empowering complexion. Seeing all the new designs is so great. Uh, Brooke is this uh, concert god. He does performances all over the place. Good for him. But obviously doesn't look too different uh, from his design because he's a skeleton. Maybe he's going to keep his clothes on, these 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 concert clothes. Uh, who's, who's to say? Now, the Sabauti archipelago has kind of d uh, dwindled into lawlessness a little bit. It is the Wild West, and people are pretending to be Luffy and gathering people for their cause when it's very clear they're not them. It's pretty funny. They're doing this in a bar and accosting people and gathering them and uh, all this stuff. But there is a woman there observing all of this. Nami looks great and she has this air of confidence about her. Uh, we also see Sanji before that, I apologize. Uh, he's gotten some facial hair. The We see his twirly eyebrow. The fringe of his hair is shifted over. And Nami rightfully tells these people, uh, these fake straw hats, that I'm not going to drink with you. You're not good enough for me. But then someone goes up to her and says, hey, would you want to drink with me? With another renewed air of confidence. And that is Usopp. Usopp here looks incredible. He, he's grown out his hair. He's packed on tons of muscle. And he says that he's finally become a true warrior. A true warrior of the sea. Sorry, just going to interject here for a few things that I didn't really touch on in the original recording that I want to be part of this. Uh, so apologies for that uh, if it's a little jarring. But I do want to mention these things. Firstly, with regards to Usopp coming back, I, I mentioned on stream that, you know, he mentions that he's, a ne he's now a brave warrior of the sea. He's now become what he wanted to be. And that's awesome. And I love that for him. And I love that he believes that. But I also said on stream, I remember saying that I hope his journey, I hope he, they didn't fast track his journey during the time skip. Because part of what I love about Usopp is the deliberate focus on his progressions, regressions, his overall very human journey. And... I'm okay with him taking a huge leap up, but I would still like to see that struggle um, post time skip. Now, I said that, but I had mi actually missed uh, a really key panel where the the fake Usopp shows himself, and Usopp is very shocked or scared or something. He's just very surprised and has this over the top reaction to it, and that's the Usopp I know and remember. So just that little interaction alone tells me that Oda doesn't. Uh, he that, that Usopp isn't wholly confident. He isn't a hundred percent a brave warrior of the sea just yet. I I think, uh, I think, and I'm glad about that. And I would expect that as well because Oda's been so clear and careful with Usopp's development so far. It's been so good that I can't imagine that it would stop being uh, dwelt upon. Maybe not as prominently, and that's okay. And I get that. But I still am glad that the signs are good that his journey's not finished. Uh, Rayleigh's in Sabauti, he's coded their ship, uh, the Thousand Sunny. Man, this poor ship has been alone for two years. Uh, hopefully it's been kept good company, but it's been coded, it's ready to go to Fishman Island, which is great. We see Robin, Robin looks beautiful. Love her design. Uh, Chopper looks pretty much the same, a little bit more, a little bit more cutesy actually. Um, a little bit more cutesy, and he very tragically uh, finds the fake straw hats and thinks he's part of them, 
and sees them doing awful things and is disappointed in them. Uh, it's a little bit of a gag. It's pretty funny um, and pretty adorable for him. But then Luffy himself, having traveled to Sabaudi, is stopped by the fake Straw Hats. And here, he shows adept use of hockey to lay these people to waste. But we get a little bit of a flashback before that, which is a lovely little detail, as Boa kind of, uh, or Hancock, excuse me, sets him off to Sabaudi and says goodbye. And she says... Well, not actually, because she says, please don't say goodbye. And Luffy says, is that all? I never say goodbye to anybody, because I always plan to see them again. Very appropriate for what's going on here, as he, as he plans to see his friends. But great spread as Luffy lays this guy to waste, this whole crew to waste using his hockey. We see Frankie, uh, and he says some lovely things. I love that he sees, he sees Robin, and he says, look at that beautiful woman over there. Is that the archaeologist supreme or extraordinaire, Robin? Frankie looks entirely different. His design is kind of unwieldy and bizarre. Uh, it's kind of crazy. But Robin, notably, which I love, she says, you haven't changed a bit, Frankie. I love their dynamic together, and it shows that he's the same heartfelt uh, goof as he always was, and Robin sees that. I love that. But it's so cool to see them, just to see them in general, but also in their time skip uh, designs. It's just so great to see them. I've missed them. It's been a hundred chapters almost. Sento Maru, upon hearing that Luffy could return to the island, uh, comes himself to do his thing, to defend or capture Luffy. After having talked about Kuma's cyborg, uh, after it, he lost his personality, acting strange. Again, more Kuma crumbs. I really want to know what's going to go on with that. But so Sento Maru comes. But then there is one straw hat who we have not seen yet. Someone who Sanji learns uh, has gotten lost and boarded a pirate ship and all this nonsense that's been going on. Sounds like someone we know. Uh, and then out of nowhere, a ship reemerges and it's been cut in half which I believe is something that Mihawk used to do. Up comes Zoro with this beautiful, beautiful new design. He looks awesome. Uh, I love his dark clothes, his three swords. He's got the scar. He's got, he's missing an eye. So wonder what the hell happened with that. I have no clue. Um, crazy training with Mihawk, maybe? I don't know. And Sanji is very soon today as he goes, oh, he's back. Uh, not like I care, though. But the reunion continues as uh, Chopper... <laughs> trying to look for Robin, thinking his whole crew made her jerks, finds Usopp and Nami. It's, it's a beautiful reunion. In the midst of this, there is some darkness as we have these two blood spatter Koribu and wet haired Caribou who are soldier killers that are kind of running rampant in Sabaudi. So that is a little bit of a problem. There's some general sort of, sort of unhinged silliness with this fake Luffy garnering his support uh, in a way that I, I dare say reminded me a little bit of Buggy, which is kind of funny. There's some nice little details here as um, Frankie has this new power as the Straw Hats are interacting where there's a hand inside a hand, which is kind of reminiscent of Robin's power. A nice little link between those two and their connection. Kind of. Might be unintentional, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, it's cool. Then throughout this, there's chaos as the pacifists wipe out the fake Straw Hats, which is kind of a reflection of Sabaudi Archipelago and what goes on there. Uh, reflecting, you know, it's like poetry, it rhymes, but this time it's knocking out the fake straw hats instead of the real ones, and the recontextualization, or sorry, the reframing of Sabaudi for the genuine straw hats is very positive. There's this beautiful song by Brooke as he does this final encore, and he thinks about Luffy and their journey going forward, and uh, the crowd realizes that he's a pirate, but don't really care because he's brought them together through the joy of music, and they support him as he decides to go to the new world and take on these new horizons. Lovely little moment for Brooke uh, that I want to mention here. And then throughout just the Zoro and Sanji fights, they're amazing. I'm not going to talk about uh, everything, but the way they sort of rag on each other and uh, poke and prod each other, and Sanji makes fun of Zoro, and Zoro insults Sanji, their dynamic is so much fun, so endearing. And I really, I really missed it, and I love that it's back. An interesting touch is that Sentomaru is now a Navy soldier, uh, hence his role here. And the pacifist has come and uh, attack Luffy, but in this moment, he dispatches of one with no problems whatsoever. He dodges their shot, and then just takes one down with uh, Gear Second, I believe. Like, no, no issue whatsoever, just on his own. Compare that to... The, the Sabaudi Archipelago arc, where they were exhausted, all eight of them, uh, nine of them, take down just one. And Luffy can now do it on his own. And not only that, but Sanji and Zoro can both take one down together. Uh, and I'm sure they could have done it on their own too. And they're bickering while they do it. So there's a lightheartedness uh, associated with them taking down these pacifistas, which I really, really enjoy because it shows how far they've come. And the new context of 
their past experiences. It's not traumatic anymore. It was a learning experience that they're stronger for. And there's amazing spreads throughout to show all this. But the trio of Chopper, Usopp, and Nami meet with uh, Robin and Frankie. Um, Zoro and Sanji are eventually coming as well. Brooke is making his way over. They all learn that Luffy is on the island. And Rayleigh says to them, Go to Grove 42. Things have been rough, things may get rough, but now is a perfect time for a new start. At this point, uh, the marine invasion of Sabaudi is in full swing. Sentomaru and the pacifistas, everyone's there to try to arrest the Straw Hats with the rumblings and rumors and misinformation all over the place, and the fake Straw Hat crew and everything. It's total chaos. In the midst of it, there are amazing, lovely crew interactions, Sanji and Zoro. Just any two interactions, any given two interactions throughout these chapters are just magical. I miss this so much. Um, but yeah, all, all hell is breaking loose on on, uh, on Sabaudi Archipelago, Grove 46, I believe it was. And Sentomaru realizes that this is a fake Straw Hat crew. Luffy reveals himself in the midst of it, and everyone realizes what's going on, everyone in Sabaudi, and the jig is up. Luffy escapes and meets Zoro and Sanji, and they have a great interaction as uh, there's an enemy there, and Zoro cuts him up, and Sanji says, Oh, I, I beat him. And Zoro says, No, I beat him. They will never stop arguing and bickering in such a loving way. But Zoro with them too, the monster trio together again. Just like the cowardly trio was together again earlier, though Usopp says that he's not part of them anymore. Then this trio meet Rayleigh after the rest of the crew have gone, and Rayleigh says to go with reckless abandon. And with all all this nonsense happening behind behind them, but with also their tragedy behind them, their pain behind them, Rayleigh says to Luffy to not look back, and Luffy says thank you. And as they set sail, Luffy goes, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna become King of the Pirates. That same old smile, that same confidence, it's back, it's renewed. I still wonder what that second dream is, but it's a beautiful, beautiful moment. And Rayleigh thinks so too, as he has tears in his eyes. Maybe reminiscent of Roger, probably there's a little bit of that, but also I think he's just proud of Luffy. He's grown to know him and really like him over the past couple of years, and it's great to see him come out of this doldrum. And in this final moment where Luffy declares that he's going to become King of the Pirates again, something that I love about this is, uh, I mentioned Rayleigh and the two-part, like, I think there's nostalgia and him seeing Roger, his best friend, his old friend in Luffy, and missing him. And also just caring for Luffy and seeing how he's surpassed and uh, he's come through these traumatic experiences better for it, determined, empowered. Um, that's lovely. But I've, I fail to mention here that Zoro and Sanji both had this beautiful grin on, in, on their faces as they see Luffy proclaim this for what seems like the millionth time, but this time it hits a little bit different because how long has it been since he last did? And the last time he thought about being King of the Pirates, he criticized himself for being weak and hated himself for it. It's really great. And I like that Sentomaru is here um, to reflect Sabaudi Archipelago as well as this sort of impetus for their growth. He caused them such problems before, but here he's just kind of a minor inconvenience. And the last thing I want to add here is that Luffy says some beautiful... Uh, just small but beautiful things to the rest of his crew as they head out. He says, There are lots of things I'd like to say to you, but never mind all that. Thank you for dealing with my selfish request for the past two years. And let's go. Love that dialogue. He And I love the knowledge that he was being um, a little self-interested at this point. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, but nonetheless, the crew would have no doubt wanted to get to him as soon as possible. And that it, it, it kind of shocked them that their captain wanted them to do this. And there was an element of self-interest to it, but there was also a great am uh, amount of wisdom to it. It was the right decision, clearly. And I think they understand that, and that's why they follow him, part, part of why they follow him. And that's why the self-interest or the selfishness, I don't think it really matters much in the grand scheme of things. They would do it no matter what. And they're used to it, of course. I think Sanji says something to the effect of, like, that wasn't the first time and it won't be the last that we follow a selfish request of yours. And they know it, and they love it, it's part of being a straw hat, and it's beautiful. And Rayleigh is raw as hell as he defends Luffy and allows him to go to go off, to sail off, and he says to those pursuing him, It's my student's farewell. I want it to be proper. I advise that you don't cross this line as with his sword out. I love Rayleigh. But then out of nowhere, Perona comes. She's the one who helped Zoro get here in the first place, and she helps him to avoid the Marines. Um, so really lovely as this person from the past who was kind of an antagonist, but helps them here. Uh, clearly a friend of Zoro's to an extent. At Grove 42, uh, Brooke goes with the rest of the Straw Hats. 
um, makes a perverted joke about seeing panties, and then gets uh, his skull cracked. Then Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji, with the help of Perona, drop in. And then Hancock and her and her people, the Kuja tribe, all defend them as they set off for Fishman Island. But then the giant bugs from Usopp's Island and the people from Wetheria with Nami start helping as well. The Kamabaka Queendom, just everywhere they've been, starts helping them to set off on this journey. And it's so empowering, these little acts of defense to help them set off on their journey and continue it. And it's just beautiful. The, this this camaraderie, this togetherness, these connections that they've made, stand them in good stead and propel them forward. And they finally, in the last spread, the beautiful spread, on the Thousand Sunny, coated in this resin, they set sail. Fishman Island, here we come. And that is, I assume, the next arc. Now, I know this is technically the return to Sabaudi arc, these five chapters. It's not really a self-contained story, so I felt okay to add it on to the end of the post-war arc. Hopefully that makes sense. And like I said, it's a nice bookend, and I think it's thematically cohesive with the despair of post-war uh, to turn to this empowerment. But, like I said, beautiful arc, or couple of arcs, whatever you want to call it. Such so gratifying to see them come together again post time skip. The theme of moving on, wiping your tears, moving on past sorrow and agony, and protecting what you need to protect. Uh, the political, uh, economic disparity, the critiques of this hugely extremist capitalism society in um, in 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 the flashback. Uh, Sabo as a character, what this arc does for Luffy in general, the recontextualization, amazing stuff. The idea of legacy, all the stuff I talked about before, it's all here, it's so rich, it's so wonderful. Uh, and then this, then this ending complexion of, Sabaudi was this place of despair, now it is our jumping off point, and we will take on the new world. Wonderful arc, wonderful arc. I would give this a 9 out of 10 as well, and put it in the upper pantheon of One Piece arcs. Top 5, 6, 7, something like that? It was wonderful, it was great stuff, uh, and a more than worthy successor to Marineford. Now in terms of my character ranking, there's been a, some tiny changes, not a huge amount of changes, but I'll list them out. In terms of honorable mentions, we have Koza, Kalgara, Iceberg, Luchi, Spandam, Mary, Cricket, Kuma, uh, Mr. Tubon Clay, Hiroluk, Doflamingo, Sengoku, Kobe, and now Dragon. I think he has enough substance to be an honorable mention. I'm still waiting for Law and Kid to cook a little bit more before uh, considering them for these sorts of lists, but it seems like they're going to be prominent, especially Kid, so I'm looking forward to that. The top 25 is as follows. Mihawk number 25. Rayleigh, little bit of a rise to 24. Love his role in, uh, in this arc. Roger number 23. Aokiji number 22. Can't wait to see what's going on with his role. Uh, the new Fleet Admiral. What's he gonna do with that? Chopper, number 21. Frankie, number 20. Uh, Sir Crocodile, a little bit of a rise, number 19. Blackbeard, number 18. Smoker, number 17. I'm still waiting for a bit more Smoker substance. I hope it comes uh, eventually. Uh, Jimbei, number 16. Loved him in this arc, too. A little bit of a rise. Wiper, number 15. Noland, 14. 13 is Buggy. 12 is Sanji. Uh, 11 is Brook, both of whom have been eclipsed by Ace now, who is number 10. Vivi is number 9, Garp is 8, Shanks is 7, Nami is 5, sorry, Nami is 6, Zoro is 5, Robin is 4, Usopp is 3, Luffy is 2, but this substance has made him really close to my number 1, which is Whitebeard. Next arc, if next time I do a video like this, if Luffy gets any amount of focus, I think he'll be number 1 again. But Whitebeard is still on his rightful throne for now. Anyways, guys, that's all I got. Thank you again for joining me. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you would like to see the next arc review, which I don't know what the arc is, but I assume Fishman Island? We'll see. That's been dragging on for a while. Maybe it's not still. But regardless, if you would like access to that next video uh, for probably Fishman Island, whatever it is, uh, you can do so. You can gain access to it right now, exclusive early access through Patreon under the $5 tier. If you want to watch my Twitch streams where I read every chapter live uh, multiple times a week, you can do so through the link in the pinned comment in description. Join my Discord server for stream updates and stuff like that. And feel free to use uh, hashtag AJPiece to enter your comment to be read aloud in a future video. Fantastic arc. Many thanks for watching, guys. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for your continued support.